Please be seated. Kalimera a happy new year. Eftihismeno tokenuri etos. We are so happy to celebrate with you the new year. And what a better place to do it than in church. Someone might say, where else could you celebrate it? Well, this is the best place. We have in our Orthodox tradition, I think most of you know, to kalo podisto. How many of you heard that word before? Kalo podisto. <laughs> it's a word that means that you start off on the right foot. We have one word for it in Greek, to kalo podisto. Starting off on the right foot. The good foot in Greek, it's translated, but in, uh, in English we say the right foot. Anyway, what does it mean? It means you, you do your first things very carefully because they're going to set the tone for all that follows. So if you're going to start a new year, where do you want to start it? You want to start it in church. You want your first journey, your first, your first food, your first glimpse of the new year to be in church. So that with your kalopodisto, your good foot, you step into that new year and you ask God that all that follows also be dedicated to him. So here you are. Today we hear this um, confluence of two themes. Of course, the one is the peritomi to Isu Christu, the circumcision of Christ. And what is the circumcision? Of course, there are many things we can say about it, but let's start at the simplest. It's the day that Christ receives his human name. Until that time, he has no, no name. You say, well, that's silly. Don't you name the baby as soon as it's born? Well, if any of you, again, grew up in the Greek culture, you'll know that sometimes a child who isn't yet baptized, because we transferred the custom from circumcision to baptism, he can be a year old, two year old, and they still call him Bebe, Bebe <laughs> or some other name, Moro. So he doesn't have a name until the day of his baptism, and then he takes a name. So the same thing with the Jewish people. They didn't give a name to the child until the official naming, which took place at the circumcision of the child, at least for the male. I don't know what they did for the female. So at that moment, he becomes a Jew. He takes a name. And what name did God give him? And that was, of course, designed from the angel that was told, that is to say, God himself chose it, but told through an angel to Joseph, you will call his name Jesus. And it tells us what that means in the Greek text anyway. It says, he will save his people. Jesus means Yahweh or God saves. That's the meaning of that word. So although many people certainly had the name Jesus in Jesus' time, he also, even at the time that he was living, it was not an uncommon name. Uh, in fact, uh, if you want to hear it also in English another way, um, think of Joshua. It's the same name. Uh, we know that from the Septuagint Greek, of course. The uh, name Joshua in, in the Septuagint Greek is Isus, and the name for Jesus is Isus. So Joshua is the other one. So it's a common name, a common name even in Jesus' time. But Jesus is given that name specifically because he is the, the fulfillment of that name. It's not just any old name. It's his name. It belongs to him more than any other because he is God who saves. The other thing that we see in the, the peritomi, of course, we said the confluence. The, the, we see that there is a, an effort to remind us that Jesus Christ, through his circumcision, came to offer his blood for the world. All of the circumcisions before Christ were prophetically indicating that the Son of the Most High would offer his, uh, his blood for the salvation of the world. And of course, the peritomi is a small amount of blood when the person is circumcised, not a large amount of blood is, is expended, just a small amount. But nonetheless, it is a bleeding. And so every child is somehow instructed, even in their body, to notice, that is to say the male children, that they if they're going to be one day the savior, they have to be willing to spill their own blood. 
And of course, no child knew, you know, am I the Savior, am I the Savior? Until Christ, of course, came, who didn't have to know it, he was it. He didn't have to understand it or come to realize it, he was the Savior. And his blood is then spilled on that day. But what do we hear in today's gospel? He's going regularly to the temple for the Feast of Pascha. In other words, we have the, the Feast of the Peritomi, the circumcision, linked to the entrance of Christ into Jerusalem where he will suffer his passion. Do you see how the two are linked? So he's going there every year. And finally, he decides to stay there at 12 years old and continue to have discussions with the high priests there. And his parents, of course, lose him. But in that, in that moment, we see that he is telling us, even at 12 years old, he's trying to say to us, this is the reason I came, to be here and to speak to these people. I came for them, to lead them back to me. And then the last of the confluences, of course, is the St. Basil the Great. And St. Basil, who was so much admired in the church for many things, but among them his great discipline and his great organizational skills and his great un unbelievably expressive love for those in need. This St. Basil taught a different type of circumcision, the one that the circumcision the church has adopted for all people, and that is the cutting of the foreskin of our heart. That is to say that we become supple to God. We become able to put off the fleshy needs of our bodies, which sometimes direct us and organize us and, and to make demands on us, and instead to put first the needs, the sensitive needs of the spirit. And so St. Basil typified that. He gave his whole entire life to serving the church. And we can't say, I'm speaking in an unusual way now, and I apologize if it offends you. I don't mean to offend you. But he wasn't a, a wimpy person. He was a very vir virile man. So for him to cut off the passion wasn't just a simple, uh, you know, something that you say, well, that's easy for him to do. No, it was a challenge for him to do. And we see that in his relationship with his brother, that he was sometimes sharp with him and even angry. But when it came to serving the people and putting them before himself, that strength, that virility came into its fullest so that he could use it to glorify God. And he set by that example a pattern for the rest of us to follow. In other words, Nothing wrong with being a virile man if you're, if you're a man or a virile woman if you're a woman, but to be someone who puts aside the needs and the demands of the flesh to put first the needs and the, and the uh, concerns of your fellow man. And that St. Basil did most excellently. We can't think of him without thinking of the word orphanotrophio or orphanage or the word hierocomio, a place for the elderly, or to think of uh, hospices and other things like that. He was the one who organized the church to care for the neediest of the needy, not just to see them on the road suffering and to give them some change or maybe even to offer them some food, but to pick them up from the street, to bring them into a place to rest and to care for them there. And uh, thankfully, that tradition still continues. And so we have great, a, a great debt of gratitude to him. So may we have this image in our mind then of the circumcision, that is for ourselves, to put off our fleshly desires, and the example of St. Basil, who putting aside his own selfish desires, thought how to serve the other as the Kalopodisto of our new year. Amen.